I want to welcome uh, Mustafa Majzoub uh, to this session today and I'm very grateful. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you on board. Sidi Mustafa Majzoub is, uh, is, is, is multi-faceted and multi-talented and uh, uh, person with a degree in Arabic from Oxford and uh, he is also pioneer of children's uh, educational material in Arabic. Abjad, it's called Abjad. That's right. yeah. and, and I've, I've been more thinking of English of late, actually. So I, I'm working very hard on a, a, an equivalent English system. But don't get me started on that, otherwise... Sheikh uh... <laughs> <laughs> Bakr, known to the world as Dr. Martin Lynx. So we are going to talk today about his book, Splendors of Quran, Calligraphy and Illumination, which had its first incarnation in, the 90, in 1976, if I remember correctly, in the World of Islam Festival, which happened in London when this book was brought out and for which Sheikh Bakr collected a lot of material and, and, and masterful and illuminating text. But I just like to, before I, I, I hand over the mic to uh, Sidi Mustafa, I just like to read the first few lines of the preface by Sheikh Bakr about. I just read those and then I'll hand over to you. My thanks for the existence of this book go first of all to the publisher, Mr. Farid Governor, chairman of the Thesaurus Islamicus Foundation, but for whose initiative and perseverance these pages would have remained nothing more than an, un, than an unfulfilled hope. Thanks must also go to the great support for this project afforded by the board of directors of that foundation. I must also thank Mr. Justin Madzu, who is our guest today, who has so ably and devotedly shared with Mr. Farid Governor some of the burdens of publication. And before that, the task of photographing in Cairo, Istanbul, Tehran, and elsewhere, so many of those pages of Quran manuscripts which are reproduced in the plates. So one could have no better introduction to Sidi Justin Madzo. Well, well I, I, I can go to my grave happy knowing that those words are written. I, I, I mean, I need to do nothing else in my life, really. I, I, I'm, I'm already a satisfied man. So with that introduction, I mean, uh, what we were hoping from you was exactly this journey, which is mentioned by Sheikh Bakr himself in the first few lines of the book, that you were intimately uh, connected to with this project in its second incarnation in this yes. new new edition. So we'd love to hear about your. Well, and, and, do, and do also jump in as I'm talking. So it's, it's more like a conversation, maybe. As, as uh, I'm here. Talking. Yes, it is a conversation. But, uh, well, I, I must first confess that uh, really my, my life was totally transformed by actually meeting Martin Links. So uh, I, I, should, I should preface that, you know, he, 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 and um, uh, it's, it, one wouldn't expect to just be casually sort of on holiday in Cairo, going to meet friends, and then just to bump into a saint. I mean, I, d I had no idea that saints lived in this day and age. And quite honestly, uh, I had the great benefit of, of a meeting. I, I never thought I'd meet him again. And then I chanced upon him again uh, a year later. So, um, and after that, I realized I have to hold on to his apron strings as hard as I can um, from then on. But, Which uh, year was this? Which year was that? It was in 1990. I, I, I was on a trip around uh, uh, Egypt with my family and because uh, I, I knew my way around. And I just happened to mm -hmm. chance on Martin Lings then in the hotel room. Oh. And, but that's another story. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but just to return, and it's not just myself who has this uh, impression of Martin Lings as a saint. Uh, I was quite taken aback once um, in a lecture where Martin Lings was talking on, on Shakespeare. And he was introduced by Keith Critchlow, um, who was uh, headed the Prince of Wales uh, 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 foundation, and he it was quite extraordinary. He he stood up and to introduce Martin Lings, he said, um, 
Uh, the person I'm going to introduce you tonight uh, is an extraordinary person, and uh, but I want to uh, highlight that by he said I was once at a talk by Schumacher, uh, the, the the author of Small is Beautiful, and he said, you know, we imagine that saints don't exist in our day and age, but we're quite wrong. I happen to know one. Uh, he works in the British Library, and he uh, and uh, and uh, Kish Krishna then said, of course, for all of us who knew Martin Lings knew that he was referring to him. So I will hand you over to this saint of a man to talk on Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, Martin Ling, he almost didn't bat an eye, uh, and he just went straight into his, his talk. Um, so well, with that in mind, I wanted to start. So if I, if I screen share one thing with you here, there's the start of my slides. Um, let's see, there we go. Can you see that? Yes, very much. Very yes, yes. Uh, now I'm, I'm jumping into Martin Lings's new edition of the book. I'm going to use the new pictures from the new edition uh, mm -hmm. to talk uh, uh, about uh, uh, the, the plate. And he he pulled out his copy of um, uh, uh, the Islamic uh, art, uh, the, the Quranic art of uh, um, calligraphy and illumination. Uh, and and he pulled open this page, which uh, and in the, in the old book there was only the right hand page of this book, uh, the, this opening, and it was missing the left hand page. <clears throat> and he said to me, uh, uh, "Sidi, if you're in in Iran, maybe you could try and see if you could find the left hand page of this beautiful uh, uh, picture, uh, because if if ever we make a second edition of the book, it would be lovely to have an opening." With both pages opposite each other, um, so uh, and uh, he he pointed out this beautiful arrangement of the, this chance row of shamsas that go almost in a uh, diagonal line on the right hand side, um, and he uh, and and he told me that this manuscript was in Mashhad uh, in the in the shrine at Mashhad uh, mm -hmm. in, in the great library there. So I went off to Iran thinking, well, that'll be a simple enough matter. I, I'll, I'll sort that out. And I'm sure if, if Martin Lings wants that page, uh, heaven will help me find it. Um, so I went to Iran and, and I set about um, getting permission to go into various museums to try and get, uh, you know, per, uh, permission to photograph uh, Korans. And, uh, and I tried as best as I could to get the best introductions for Mashhad. And I even traveled up to Mashhad. I went to the library. I saw some of the sister volumes of this uh, uh, of this uh, Mus'haf because it's in 30 sections, and, and this is one of the sections that exists. And um, and I realized that of the sections that I wanted, uh, none of them were in the library per se. The, the volume I needed with this opening was, was locked away in a display cabinet. Um, and uh, but I knew I had to have this opening and no other. So mm -hmm. and I knew knew that I had to get permission. And the, the Ayatollah, who is called Ayatollah Tabasi, uh, in charge of the shrine, uh, refused to give me permission to photograph. <laughs> no matter what I did, and I mean I was pulling my hair out. And um, and in the end, I thought, well, Martin Lings wants this photograph. I'm sure the circumstances will arise when uh, it will. I will be able to take it. I know I'm being denied permission now. So I thought, well, I'll, um, I'll uh, maybe, maybe Mr. Tabasi will be moved. Maybe he'll pass away. And at that point, I'll need to have a photographer at hand in Mashhad to move immediately to photograph this page. And... Um, so I, I asked a friend of mine in Tehran, do you know somebody who, uh, uh, who would know a good photographer in Mashhad? So she put me in touch with a, a photographer. And as I was speaking to the, uh, the, the man over the phone, and I had a lady actually with me who was working in, in, a, in a museum also where I was trying to photograph Korans. And she was standing next to me and I was having this conversation with the man and he said, oh, well, you won't believe this, but before the revolution, I went to Mashhad and I was photographing some of the Quran manuscripts there myself. <laughs> and I, I have a handful of these photographs, uh, these transparencies with me. But of course, uh, you know, the, 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 the things you want obviously won't be in those transparencies. I said, well, uh, I'm sure they will be. Uh, because <laughs> if Martin Lings wants that opening, I can now see that you're the providential means for me obtaining this photograph. 
the, the authorities refused to let me um, photograph there, so you must have photographed the opening that I want in advance. And the heaven has arranged that for me because Martin Lings is a saint and saints uh, have what they desire. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Or uh, I'm sure heaven would help them for that. And the man laughed on the phone and said, well, you can come down to my house and have a look, but you, I, can, I can assure you, you're not going to find it. And anyway, I only photographed single pages. I didn't photograph openings because I was, I was working for a catalog. I said, never mind, I'm sure you'll find when I get there, I'll find what I need. So he was very bemused. I went with the lady who was with me and I said to her, I, can, I now feel I'm actually living uh, a miracle that is, is slowly unfolding in front of our eyes. Uh, I mean, we know that the chance of it being there are, are impossible, but I know that we'll arrive and we'll find that, paint, uh, that, that picture. So we arrived at his house. Uh, uh, he showed me his collection of maybe six or seven pages of slides. I picked up the first page. I couldn't see it. I picked up the second page. And there in front of me with, the, with these four uh, shamsas uh, in this straight line. I said, that's the opening that I want. And the man almost fell to the ground in disbelief. And, um, and then, so the, the page we're looking at is that photograph taken by that photographer uh, oh. maybe 10 or 20 years before I actually needed it, waiting for me to find it in his archives. <laughs> amazing. That's quite amazing. Um, so, and, um, and another thing to mention to you before we begin is that uh, Martin is very keen to, uh, re to produce this work uh, as a sort of compendium of the great uh, beauty of the Islamic civilization, because some of the highest uh, beauties that uh, Islam reveals are in this art of the book. And he very much wanted uh, the, the, the book produced as a, as a resource uh, that might actually somehow survive uh, from this, so to speak, era of mankind into the beginning of the next. Um, he, uh, he once mentioned to me, just in passing, because Martin Ling's often thought of us being at the end uh, of this cycle of uh, time somehow, that we're, the things are very close to an end. And that, uh, that the, in, in the next phase of uh, uh, the, the world, maybe something of the previous civilizations and some of their beauties may be able to sort of pass through that barrier. And I remember him mentioning in passing that this book, uh, should it come out, might be such a resource that, who knows, a copy of this book might survive our, our civilization and pass through a great destruction into the beginning of the next. Mm. And then it's, it's a curious thought to put with you. So now let, mm. let's get to, to the book itself. Um, so the, the book opens with... Um, uh, talking about the different forms of calligraphy and, and it focuses, the first uh, section is on uh, Kufic. Um, and I, let me see if I can find some of what uh, Martin Ling says. I, I've got all sorts of bits of notes scrambled all over the place that uh, might be of, of help. Um, but, uh, In fact, trying to find my way through my notes might be uh, not helpful because it might actually slow us down too much. So, so let me just talk uh, from the top of my head. I think that might be easier. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Sheikh Obak, in fact, one of the mistakes I made uh, with this book is I, I knew the book for some time before I actually started working with Martin Ling's on it. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, I, I'd made the mistake of not reading the text, the the the, the, sli uh, the, the small text that comes with the book, uh, you know, because it's, it's, it's predominantly pictures. So one mm -hmm. looks at the pictures thinking, well, I'll be able to understand what the pictures are. But in mm -hmm. fact, uh, the, the text of this book is really a fantastic eye-opener in so many ways, and it teaches one to be able to look and to see and locate the art that one's looking at. And in a way, I would say Martin Lings's book is a key uh, to be able to understand all sorts of art from all sorts of civilizations in all sorts of domains. It's not just the, the art of the book. Mm -hmm. 
And he talks of the three great spiritual um, motives of religion. Um, uh, and, and they're sort of summed up with the words in Arabic, makhafa, uh, mahabba, and ma'arifa. Makhafa is like the awe or fear of God, uh, mahabba, uh, the, uh, love, and uh, ma'arifa, knowledge. So in a certain sense, um, the early phases of the Quran uh, well, when when the Muslims began to write, there, there's a great sense of makhafa which predominated. And it's only the absolute essential that comes into um, the script. And there, there's a sort of majesty and all, uh, almost awe that, that you can see in, in this uh, lettering. Even the way the letters, uh, the words are, are spread out and sometimes the aleph is far from the next letter and so on. It's, it's like Everything is done with great reverence and awe. Uh, let me give some other examples here. Um, now, the, the, uh, in, in the early Kufic uh, manuscripts, uh, the, there's this, um, uh, uh, the, the, there's a, a very a sm a gentle sort of beginning uh, and, and, uh, of, of illuminated elements. And um, here you can see a surah heading. The, these two pages actually are not from the same manuscript. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's one of the few cases in the book where uh, we place book, uh, pages from different manuscripts opposite each other to balance them out. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what's very interesting here is this feature of the tree uh, that comes as a sort of palmette uh, and, and points in uh, and sits in in the margin and uh, Martin Lings has uh, Sidi Abu Bakr uh, has uh, some wonderful um, teaching in this book about symbolism altogether and uh, and he, he talks about the, the importance of the symbolism of the tree which of course is mentioned in the Quran itself uh, so the, the illuminators drew on the Quranic substance, so to speak, and extracted from it uh, this, uh, many of the symbols that actually came to be used uh, to illuminate it. Uh, uh, the Quran talks of a, a good word is like a good tree, uh, and its, it's roots are in, uh, are in, in, on earth and its branches in heaven. So, in fact, the margin of the, uh, the page represents uh, heaven and the next world. So, mm -hmm. so when, in Quranic art, when one sees these um, uh, uh, elements that, that move into the, uh, uh, into, into the margin, you're, you're, you're having a sort of impetus that drop, pulls you up back towards heaven, so to speak. Mm. There's, um, there's so much one could say about this lettering, of course, as well. And uh, the, 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 the word above the surah heading on the right uh, mm. is the word yes judun. It's oh. very beautiful the, the way the Arabic letters in Kufic sit on top of each other. And uh, the, the dots, for instance, you see the red dots, these are actually the, the vowels. And, and not the, the, the diacritical dots which distinguish ali, uh, you know, ba and noon and so on. So, so this top, the, the top right two letters, that says inna. So, oh. so, the, so the dot underneath is a kestra, and the dot oh. above the noon, which is hanging down, this, this deep letter, is, 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 uh, that's a noon. So the, the, the dot above it means that's a fatha. So that's inna. So that's inna ladina in the... Uh, and this is a ra, rabbika, I guess. Um, <laughs> so let's, anyway, so let's, let's, let's move on here. Um, this, this is a later uh, uh, Kufic. Uh, is a, a Kufic continued to be developed, and, and it, was, it was used even when uh, Nas scripts and the more... Um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, the, 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 the more cursive scripts were developed. I mean, Kufic would have been quite difficult to write, um, but uh, the, the later scripts were, were easier for the pen. And, and the, 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 
the Kufic uh, style, especially in the East, uh, developed into the tandem and was modified and influenced by the, the, the more um, cursive scripts. But this is a very a particularly beautiful page that came up for auction uh, during the, the time that um, uh, I was working with uh, uh, Martin Lings on his, uh, the, the new edition of the book. And he had always wanted, a, a, there's one other page of this Quran which he knew of in Mashhad. Unfortunately, that, unfortunately, that page was not in the collection of, of photographs that I found uh, with the man in Tehran. Uh, and I knew that Martin Lings would love to have a, a photograph of that. And as it happened, then a, an auction came up where this page appeared. I, I went to the auction hoping to buy the page myself. But the man, uh, but, but there was an art dealer there who was working for a, a, um, the, a, a man in Kuwait who had a museum there who had a budget of something like 30,000 pounds to buy this page. <laughs> so I, I, was, I wasn't able to buy it for myself, but I was able to ask him uh, to photograph it for Martin Lings's book. So Alhamdulillah, that's another one of those providential gifts that uh, uh, openings that heaven made. Um, here's a great, yeah, mashallah. Well, well, well uh, what, what's your comment on this? I like the off, Zidi. <laughs> so striking, I mean, as, as a design, even and just the verticals, yes, are very striking. The verticals, well, uh, what, the <laughs> uh, when you mentioned verticals, uh, Martin Ling's own uh, handwriting in Arabic also has this, uh, a, a great leaning to verticality and horizontality, who's very drawn to this symbolism. And, mm. uh, and Kufic has, has that. So if you look at this, uh, uh, it has this sort of vertical and horizontal uh, sort of mm. element where, where it, it, it moves uh, and it flows, uh, but also has this upright, uh, very... Um, uh, so, so, so it's a wonderful balance between the two. Mm. Uh, so going back to this uh, manuscript, uh, when I was looking through these um, plates yesterday, um, mm. I, I spotted that there's a, a terrible mistake in this page. And it's quite curious how um, in some of the early manuscripts you do occasionally find errors. And uh, and uh, I was surprised to find that this is bal yu'thiruna here, where there should be tu'thiruna. The, 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 the calligrapher has put two dots below instead of two dots above this. this mm -hmm. So, and it, it's curious. I have come across some wonderful manuscripts where occasionally the, the scribe has made a mistake and he simply mm -hmm. crossed the mistake out and then continued. Um, mm -hmm. They haven't, uh, it's, it's not like a sort of modern mentality that, oh, I have to throw that page away and start all over again. I know that they would, they would you, you know, uh, they, they dealt with it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, this page uh, is one of the other transparencies that I came across uh, at the same time that I had discovered uh, the, those uh, transparencies in Tehran. And did this also uh, managed to come into the book with Martin Lins? Uh, uh, is, is this what's called Eastern Kufic? Now uh, this is at a later stage, you know. Yeah, yes, I, yes, it is a later stage. It, it, and it, and you, you can. It's very easy to read this. I mean, if you look at this, you can see. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if I can, if I if I zoom in on here, ah, I, I mean, you can see that. I mean, yes. a, a modern reader can read that. That's Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ah. Whereas, whereas a modern reader would find it difficult. If I go back here, uh, yeah, to yeah. Really read uh, what what this might be saying. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, it's it's more difficult mm -hmm. to disentangle that. Um, mm. But since I'm zoomed in here, you can see that this dot, as I said to you, is, is a this is a dhamma because it's in the line of the. But but here we have uh, these little strokes, which are sometimes added. This the, the strokes are like the equivalent of the modern dots. So, oh, so this is this is uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. So uh, when well, the aleph is not written in here, um, there we are. So. Fascinating. So let me. 
Let's, let's go back to here. So this, uh, this I knew Martin Lings would love to have this because um, uh, it's very similar to one of the manuscripts that he particularly loved himself, uh, which is this one. And, uh, uh, and, and, it, and the, the different sections of it are in different collections. Um, and this is the final page uh, of, of, this, of that manuscript. It's like uh, a piece of jewel, jewelry. I mean, it's so yes, subhanAllah. And um, interesting enough, here, uh, the, the Quran ends here. This is Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. So, this is Minal Jin Nati Wan Nas. And uh -huh. here in this band underneath it says the date when it was written. And then this beautiful calligraphy here, it says Katabahu Ali. And the year, uh -huh. the, uh, the, uh, the, it dips underneath the ha and all the way it takes back. And, uh -huh. and, and what's very touching about this manuscript is that the name of the calligrapher was not Ali. It was Ali. You can see just about under here that the name has been ex expunged. Ibn something, 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 something here. And this looks like yeah, Aleph, maybe Zakaria at the end. Who knows? And but out of a sort of sense of pious uh, wish for this Quran to be associated with Sayyidina Ali, somebody oh. that you remove those. And it's, it's extraordinary how many uh, manuscripts uh, you find which are purportedly written by Sayyidina Ali, who, of course, is, uh, in a way, all the silsilas of all the traditions that go back to calligraphy, they all, so to speak, go back to Sayyidina Ali. He's one of the great... Um, sources of inspiration for uh, the calligraphic arts. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this is an opening which was in the, the first book and happily in the second as well. It's, 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 uh, mm -hmm. And it shows all the different uh, possibilities. Uh, I think this, this type of calligraphy is called Carmathian for some reason. Oh, I see. Uh, and this, I can zoom in on this as well. Uh, uh, this is what, what's sometimes called floriated kufic. So, mm -hmm. so there's a sort of embellishment. There's this, uh, this very majestic and rigorous uh, kufic by, by the slow development in, in its eastern form actually ends up with these sort of flourishes, um, um, oh, yes. Yes. Or, or organic elements that start growing out of the letters, and like the top of this curve, for instance, at the top left-hand side. Yes. Uh, if I, let's see if I can zoom back to the original side. It, now, inter if you see, if I if I go back to these pages, these uh, these openings, they give you some. Set, for instance, this uh, this opening shows that this Quran in its original was at least uh, possibly the same size as the book, or possibly bigger. But, uh, mm -hmm. but whenever the openings are smaller, uh, we would than than our book, we always re reproduce the image in smaller size uh, and it's life size so that's a very useful thing to know about the second edition of the book because mm -hmm. it gives you a sense of the original size mm -hmm. but many of the books uh, many of the masahif are actually the size of our book oh. um, especially the 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 books uh, uh, the masahif from the 13th and 14th centuries because the, the, uh, in fact the arabs knew better than anyone about a sizes yeah, and that they knew that uh, a paper was such a precious resource. And of course, if you fold a piece of paper, uh, you don't want to lose the, uh, for, if you want a smaller book, you, you still want the same ratio of, of page length to height, mm -hmm. uh, or width to height. So, and, and the A format is the only one that allows you to fold and allow you to have the same ratio each time you fold. Uh, and and so so there are there is a sort of standardization more or less. Uh, so this book actually represents a kind of typical size of a large uh, mushaf that you would find. Yeah. Now this uh, again another wonderful sort of miraculous story with this um, uh, this opening. Uh, mm -hmm. Sidi Abu Bakr uh, came across this. Kufic, uh, uh, late Kufic example, uh, quite late in the day when we were producing the book, and he very much wanted it in his book. Uh, it came up at auction, uh, so a man bought it, and then he had problems financially, and somehow the, 
the, the his his manuscript ended up uh, uh, being under lock and key uh, by a bank or something. But finally, after great difficulty, the permission again came for this to be included in the book. Uh, so let, let, let me just uh, switch to you, Sinta uh, Wood, for a second. If you want to maybe add any comments or questions, while I just uh, briefly look through also my uh, notes in case I can find something useful to say with, uh, for Martin Lings himself. Well, that might be very appropriate, especially as tomorrow is his death anniversary. Oh, that's and, uh, so maybe we could. Do you have any images of, the, of those uh, beautiful opening pages with the drama trick? Oh, absolutely. Yes, they're, yes, they're, they're, they're coming. I, I was sort of taking you through uh, the book by, um, uh, uh, by its order, so to speak. But let I just, see. Uh, let me quickly. One thing I wanted to mention about this book is that it really, uh, I would encourage anybody to read the text. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's such one, a wonderful um, uh, instructions on symbolism of things. And, um, so we'll, and yes. uh, let me just see if I can. This book is available in Pakistan at Liberty Books and uh, other good bookshops. And people can also have it ordered. Yeah. Uh, easy. Used to be, and this is the size. If it, if you could okay. light here, because we're having a storm outside, so it's yeah. nothing on back. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Let me see if I can. Um, well, I'm I'm afraid I've not been as as well prepared as I could have been for giving you quotes from Martin Mings himself, but I, I'll find them as as we go, hopefully. Uh, but I don't know where I've written them down. Yeah. So let's let's go back. A question here. Yes. Yes. Can you read it? Oh, but what is that? The question on the screen. Oh, oh. Let me let me see. No, let me see. Salam, Mr. Justin. Uh, I would like to ask you about Kufi script. That why it was written in landscape format. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yes, it's a curious question. Uh, I'm not sure is the answer to that, especially mm -hmm. since some of the very early uh, Qurans that we have um, in Kufic script, there's a sort of sloping uh, uh, letters of the Kufic uh, writing. It's called mail. Uh, it's, it, it's possibly possibly the very first Qurans which were produced and distributed uh, around the Islamic uh world i think um dur during um uh the second caliphate of uh, sayyidina omar i believe um uh, they they were uh, they were in in not in landscape format they they were the, uh, the, the uh that they were taller than they were wide um oh. the it's um of course the, the early manuscripts were tend to be on vellum so you're limited by the size of the animal and the uh, for the, the the sheet that you write on and um, these uh, Kufic Qurans, quite often when you see them uh, and handle them, um, you often find that the, uh, the, the writing is much clearer on one side than on the other side. So on the skin side of the, of the, uh, the vellum, um, the, the, they tend to be better preserved. But on the fatty reverse sides of, of the skin, uh, they tend to be uh, less well preserved. So the fade, but, the fade. Yes, but it's possible that the landscape Quran, uh, the landscape may have also lent um, itself very easily to the symbolism that was used in in the early Qurans, especially the symbolism of the tree. So you could draw the tree and these sort of elements of the palmettes easily into the the sides. Um, and there may be traditions of uh, early books um, that, that existed at that time. The, 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 but uh, but, uh, but I'm not I'm not sure about. It. Uh, let me so let me go back to then move out of the, the world of um, Kufic and step into the next world of uh, uh, Nas mm -hmm. and um, 
Um, so uh, the, this is a, a, a very famous manuscript uh, by a man who's generally known as Ibn al uh, I think it's from um, uh, uh, Sorry? Uh, I thought, did we lose you? Uh, no, no, I'm still here. I'm just, I'm just fumbling around in the background. Please forgive me. Uh, yes, uh, so this is uh, uh, written and illuminated by Ali Ibn, Hil Ibn Hilal, called Ibn Bawab. Ah. Um, and, and, and this dated 391. So, which is a thousand, uh, almost exactly uh, 1000 AD. Mm. And, uh, and a complete facsimile was made of this book, because uh, this is pretty much the only uh, extant copy that we have that we can be sure is from the hand of this very famous calligrapher. And he's, mm. uh, uh, he, he is really the first great master who's accredited with this, uh, this hand and possibly the, the man who actually invented it uh, or, or derived it. And the, the Nast goes on to be one of the great um, scripts that's used. Uh, uh, possibly more Qurans have been written in this uh, script and uh, scripts related to this Nast than almost any other. Um, and here is... Um, so. Uh, Martin Links has a chapter, he calls his chapter Nas and, uh, uh, and other small, um, I forget uh, mm -hmm. the title of his chapters, but uh, uh, um, uh, uh, small scripts. And if you look at, uh, this is from a very uh, famous calligrapher uh, who's called Ibn al-Bawar, I uh, know Ibn Bawar, uh, um, Yaqut al-Musta'asini. Oh, and, uh, and Yes, uh, he, uh, some of the very greatest calligraphers uh, are his disciples and disciples of his disciples. And he lived in Baghdad during the time that Baghdad was uh, sacked by uh, and that's in, uh, in about the mid-13th uh, um, century. Um, but the, the Yakut uh, manuscripts uh, are the, the, the crown jewel of any sort of manuscript collection, uh, and they're few and far between. Mm -hmm. And it's, this is a wonderful example of that. Um, but if I, if I zoom in on the, the calligraphy, you can, um, you can see how uh, wonderfully fluid and, effect, uh, uh, and easy it is and, and effective ah, for, for yes. writing. Easily. Um, and this is another page from that manuscript. Uh, the, the, the Ibn Bawab, sorry. And then this is uh, the Yaqut. Uh, and this yeah. is an opening from within the Yaqut. This is in, uh, uh, these pages are in, in Martin Lings' original book. But I'm very happy that uh, with my photography in Turkey, I was able mm -hmm. to add other examples from Yaqut's hand. Oh. Um, this is a particularly beautiful example. I think it's from the Turkish and, and Islamic Museum. But if you look mm. in here, this is actually more uh, closely related to a script called Rehan. That's what I was about to tall, ask you. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's, it's a lighter sort of script. It's not really related to Nas as such. It's related to the more monumental scripts like Muhattaq and Fuluf, but on beautiful. a sort of smaller scale. Uh, beautiful. And, uh, and uh, here again, this is another, this is another Yakut, and this one is in the Iran Bastan uh, Museum. The left-hand mm -hmm. page of this opening was in uh, in Sidi Abu Bakr's original uh, book. So I'm happy yes. again. It's another case where I was able to match the left and right-hand pages. Uh, and here is another Yakut from the Turkish and Islamic Museum in. in, in wow, wow, wow. Istanbul. Quite a few are here. Yes. Now, uh, one of the strange things is that I used to be under misapprehension um, 
for many years that uh, somehow um, Yakut students maybe even uh, perfected and were even greater than the, uh, the master Yakut himself. Mm -hmm. uh, only as much as I was um, a, a very sort of uh, uh, impressed by the, 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 the later Mohakak scripts, the, the, the rather magnificent scripts that we'll see in, in a moment. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, in all the Yakut manuscripts that I photographed, I never came across any of these uh, large Mohakak manuscripts. But in fact, he did produce um, manuscripts like that because there's one single example that exists in the Top Kappa Palace, which unfortunately I never saw because it was being restored at the time uh, that I, I was photographing. Um, mm -hmm. But, but uh, he, I'm sure he is quite as great as his disciples. I so let, let, me show you, let me show you one of his disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the mask of uh, uh, Ibn Sheikh Sohruwadi, and oh. we, will we, we will see some of his masterpieces later. Uh, but it's, what, it's wonderful to have an example of his nas hand here. And I think one of the things that I can say about this edition of the book is that if you compare the two books, uh, this book is much richer in terms of great examples of nas than in uh, Martin Lindsay's first edition. And, yes. and that's really because of the, the great treasures of nas that exist in the Turkish museums, which I was able to photograph and some of the exa examples in Tehran. He, he was a student of, uh, of, of Yakut. Yes, he's, he's one of the students. And here's another student, or possibly a student of a student. This is mm -hmm. uh, uh, Yahya Jamali, a Sufi, he's called. Mm. And this is another example of his, his hand. Now, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, this, um, this manuscript on the, the subsequent pages it, it alternates between large and small uh, 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 texts uh, placed in, on the same page. The, the mm -hmm. calligraphy is trying to show how brilliantly he can manage the two different fonts side by side. But uh, that's not something that uh, Sidi Abubakar at all uh, liked very much. And there's an example of one of those pages in the um, PowerPoint that you had, um, uh, Timur. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but we could show that to the Fokola later, mm -hmm. uh, all the other friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, here is again another uh, Yakut student, a uh, known six, uh, and it's not uh, the, the list varies to who exactly they might be or who are students uh -huh. of those six in terms. But this 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 uh, calligraphy is called. Um, uh, uh, Arghun al-Kamili. And uh, let me uh, zoom in on this very, very beautiful hand as well. You can see. It's, uh, oh, this is amazing. Amazing. It's, uh, in, in all the time that, that I spent with these manuscripts and museums, I was always amazed by how wonderfully black the, the, the calligraphers could make their ink and how perfectly they managed. Uh, here's another one of the student, students, uh, Mubarak Shah. Mm. And we'll see some of their work in other fo formats later. Uh, this is one of uh, Martin Lindsay's very favorite uh, openings. And he used to use this sometimes in, in his lectures when he used to lecture on these subjects. What's very beautiful is in the bottom right-hand side, you have the word Sajda sitting inside mm. its own little shrine. Mm -hmm. um, to, to remind you that this is an opportunity to make the, uh, a, a special prayer because of the word Wallahu Yas Judun appearing in the text. Uh, and then let's come here. So this is, uh, this is a later Turkish example. I mean, uh, and uh, the, the, the Turkish uh, manuscripts from the 18th, 19th century, they're almost all as wonderful as each other, the great masters. Um, so that then brings us to what Sidi uh, Obaku uh, would call the Age of Magnificence, and, uh, which, which is from the 13th century. I wish I could, uh, let, let me just see, uh, so Timur, I'll leave you to, to mention anything. 
uh, while I just again have a last ditch mm -hmm. attempt to see if I could find my own notes. Somebody has asked this question, sir. Yes. Can you please give a brief description of illumination? Uh, illumination just uh, basically means uh, the, the the painting and design uh, mm -hmm. is incorporated. It's not the the written uh, text itself. Mm -hmm. And of course, the word illumination is rather wonderful because it comes from the word light, you know, to give light to a page. So, so the gold and the colors is sort of, um, and of course, that brings us to, to uh, another subject, um, uh, which is. Um, uh, someone is uh, requesting if you could zoom in into this particular slide a little bit. Certainly. Books we've been looking at so far. So, if you imagine the book that, you're, that we're holding, um, mm -hmm. this, is, this is twice as big as the uh, the copy of Splendors of Quran Calligraphy and Illumination. I would say. If you imagine, imagine putting two of these books side by side. That's the size of one of the pages. Uh, so, so in fact, you would normally see this at this kind of scale. You know, you would get it much closer, and um, <laughs> and this is um, this script is called uh, Muhattaq, and mm -hmm. um, which which kind of refers to the idea of the perfection uh, that uh, exists in this script, um, this perfect balance of verticality and horizontality uh, that that sort of has this flowing. Uh, it, it has a momentum. Uh, Horizontally speaking, mm. um, let me just show you other examples. Here's this is an opening from this uh, this book, and here is is the, the, now we spoke of Ibn Sheikh al Sohrawardi earlier. This is his mm. muhattaq uh, in a black pen, and um, I would say for myself is one of the most beautiful of, of, of for, for me is one of my favorite of all the Quran manuscripts. Uh, and if I zoom in. On this page. Oh, yes. um, one of the things that Martin Lings mentions is that, uh, of course, there's this wonderful verticality and horizontality here, again, evocative of what we were saying earlier about the Kufic. And mm. what um, Martin Lings does mention is that the, the, the Nas really doesn't have the ability, the earlier. Uh, smaller uh, fonts that we were looking at, uh, which are more cursive, they don't really have the majestic counterpart, so to speak, to Kufic that the Mohattaq and um, full of uh, type of scripts. And and there's a similar script to this, which is uh, Rayhan, which is slightly uh, thinner and more delicate. Um, but these larger monumental uh, scripts, uh, they they balance very beautifully with um, uh, with the Kufic. A, uh, and Kufic is often reserved for the um, surah headings, as we see here. This is, uh, it's, this is written. Um, uh, this is a, a surah al uh by the look of that. Um, stylized palmet, again stylized of the tree, it's rooted. Earth and its branches in heaven, uh, but of course the other great symbol is is the shisa. Yeah, if, I, if I zoom in here, it's, it's like a little. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's something between a, a, a floor and sometimes very concretely like a little sun, uh, which is the other great symbol uh, that the calligraphers were able to draw on um, mm -hmm. by. I come here. Uh, this uh, right-hand page you'll find in in Arms' um, first uh, book, and here you can see this this roundel in the margin. Um, mm. it, it, it's 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 like a symbolic sun, and um, and they're, they're called the shamsa. So so you 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 identify the movement of the uh, verses. So each five verses. The, uh, the illuminator would put in uh, either uh, a symbol like this the, on the bottom left. The, this actually is a sort of stylized letter ha, which means five. 
Um, and here, this is like the 10th marker. So this means 10 verses have passed. Uh, and so, so you alternate between, uh, so each time you go from five to 10 to five to 10, right? Mm -hmm. Here is another of uh, Ibn Sheikh It's such a treat, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, That's yeah, the no. comment we're getting. We're getting these comments and they're so beautiful and so on. Uh, so, oh, but, but let me tell you something about this extraordinary manuscript. I, I, when, of course, after I photographed these manuscripts, I came back to England and I showed them to my calligrapher friend who mm -hmm. I was working on my children's project with, a man called mm -hmm. Bahija Dari. Druze from, oops, excuse me, I'm uh, here. He's a Druze from uh, uh, Lebanon. Uh, his mm -hmm. original home was uh, Beirut. And his father had been a calligrapher, his grandfather, and I believe his great grandfather were calligraphers. And I showed him some of these openings that I brought by these photographs. And um, what I want to tell you is his reaction. He said to mm -hmm. me, uh, uh, in fact, he started to cry. I mean, he had tears in his eyes, welling up in his eyes. And he said to me, I can't believe what I'm looking at. He said, uh, all my life I've been involved with calligraphy. But any mm. calligrapher, when he writes something, he always knows himself. His eye will look to some little detail and say, oh, but well, that's a little bit out of balance. That could be a little bit better. That could be a bit, you know, mm -hmm. the, just, the positioning of this or that or the other could have been a little bit more imaginative or more. He said, but when I look at this page, it mm. brings uh, tears to my eyes because this is a kind of human perfection that I didn't know could exist. Oof. The person oh. who wrote this, he said, he said, when my eye looks on these let this lettering, I, I simply can't fault it for anything. And what's more is when I look at it everywhere that I look, I'm inspired by the imaginative power and inspiration that's flowing from the imagination of the calligrapher. I mean, for instance, look, look at this beautiful way that the, the, uh, the dot of the bar is snuggled inside the ha here, and this absolute heavenly sort of perfection. Really. Yes. And uh, I've worked, uh, strange enough, uh, Bahij and I, that, that was the name of this calligrapher friend of mine, Allah Yohamu, uh, we started actually outlining all of this text uh, using uh, Illustrator. And um, uh, we had this mar marvelously strange idea that we would try to reproduce the missing elements of this uh, because there's only six ajza of this book that exists. And um, so the, the other 24 volumes are missing. Mm -hmm. But um, we, we thought if we could study and understand all the different elements of this, maybe we could reconstitute uh, a quasi Sohrawadi uh, volume. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we would use some of the other existing uh, Qurans which have a similar font as the as a guide um mm. but so so i've actually spent a lot of time looking at this font and interestingly enough well, one of the things i've discovered is if you remove the uh, the vocalizations these little straight lines the fatah and the kasra it's mm. it's amazing how difficult it is to put them back into the text beautifully uh, i mean the way the fatah and, and kasra and uh, the dots are, are, are distributed is so wonderfully imaginative. It's not just the letter forms themselves, but the, the dots and the diacritical markings are really quite extraordinary. You like in the Samavat, the, the way the fatas are staggered and beautiful. Yes, yeah. so, let's zoom in on Samavat. Uh, I mean, for instance, look how the two dots of the tower are above each other and what uh -huh. a lovely airy uh, impression that makes. And look at the three mm -hmm. dots under the scene. Now, that's something you don't normally see, but mm -hmm. it's very peculiar to this script. What that, those three dots mean is, I am not the letter sheen. Don't mistake me accidentally for a sheen. I'm the other one. Uh, for instance, uh -huh. this letter ha in Rahman has underneath it the, the letter ha. And that, mm -hmm. that means is, I am the letter ha. Don't think. I mean, for instance, if you saw the sukun above it and accidentally thought that that is a dot, don't mm -hmm. think that I could be a kha. 
And then, mm. uh, but it's interesting that later calligraphers, even the great Turkish calligraphers, they started um, uh, not using these symbols quite as the way they were originally intended. For instance, uh -huh. if you look here, above scene is also this this little like winged figure. Mm. Now, I don't know if you know what that might be. Uh, that oh. was actually a stylization of the word la. Uh, oh. So th that also means do not read this as sheen. That's another indication this is not a sheen, it's a scene. Oh. Now you it's just a bit as an ornament. Now but, but, it but is it's, an yes, ornament. in modern calligraphy, they, they sprinkle these symbols around as fillers for s empty mm. spaces that they want to fill. But for mm. instance, if you look up here, this little winged character here must mm. be written because it's to make sure you can't accidentally read the ra as a zain. So that, oh, yeah. that says this is not a zain. Oh. Here, and now here the, the little butterfly figure is missing actually, that's a mistake on his part. <laughs> he would have normally included that. Um, but let me give you some, now let me, let, since we're talking about such things, there's such a, here for instance, look, this is a very exactly, perfect example of what we why we need these letters. Here's mm. the word Al-Aziz. Mm. Now, a, a, a poor reader of Arabic might think this is a, 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 a Ghaniz. And they might mm. think this is a Ain. But the fact you have this little Ain symbol underneath, this means I am only an Ain. I cannot be a Ghain. So in mm. fact, if you are a rain, you cannot write a rain underneath here. You, you can only write the ain to show this is the ain, not the rain. If you have mm -hmm. a rain, you don't write the ain. I see. And so here, this, this little ha here means I am a ha, and so on. Now, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. This is Hans uh, al Was. Now, this, is, uh, this actually is the letter Saad. So the letter Saad stands in for the word Was. In Hamzat al Was. Oh. And this symbol here, which you will be very familiar with, is the mad on the alif. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the word mad written out. This end hook is the mean, and the, here's the del. So this is actually a word that was written saying, I am mad, the alif mad. Ah. Um, there, you know, there's an ain here. So let's see what other little symbols I can see like that. Um, so here, yeah, of course, this, this says this is I'm a ha, uh, But the arrangement of letters is also so beautiful. I mean, like, a, like oh, a design. Now look over here. Since I've shown you that that little butterfly is a la, here ah. is the word lamb. Mm -hmm. The lamb, the lamb is written in above the, uh, the lamb because the lamb in in the Muhaqqad script can tend to look like a calf. Yes. And, and in fact, the little Hamza on the calf is a Kufic letter calf. It's not a Hamza, in fact, originally. So I, I can maybe show you an example of one of those as we go along. But look at the beautiful way in which the, the long letters slip on top of each other, like swords, and, and, and there are these beautiful tips of the lettering filled in. Like, uh, that's one of the great... Um, Wonders of the Muhaqqaq script. Indeed. I, can, I remember the, the sections in the Quran where Sheikh Albaq would point out, uh, it, um, I forget the exact Arabic, La Tazru wa Ziratun Wizra Ukhra, but the, all the Ra's and the Waws and the Zain's all stacked on top of each other, especially the. Um, I'm trying to find an example of the calf in Sohra Wadi. Some very beautiful comments coming. Um, was not saying they seem to be like living characters. Yes. The flow of the Mahakar. Well, the, 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 the wonderful thing, again, if I, I should I should really go back to, let me see if I, let me start reading some of Martin Lindsay's comments, even if they're not in the right order of what I'm saying. Um, Ah, here we go. So, but uh, actually, no, let, let, let me let me move on to one or two of the other. Uh, All right. Let's see. Uh, this is one of Martin Lings's very favorite. Uh,
a manuscript. Now imagine that this manuscript is twice as big as your book on splendors. Uh, mm -hmm. Now this manuscript uh, for a single page, this manuscript is double the size of this manuscript. So, so mm -hmm. imagine this would a single page of this manuscript would be four uh, four books of splendors of Quran and calligraphy uh, put mm -hmm. placed side by side. So that whole opening is is eight books of Quran uh, splendors. Um, Amazing. And um, this is uh, Martin Ling says something interesting about this. He says that um, the Muhakkat and Rehan scripts tend to be preferred for the use in these monumental, majestic Qurans. But um, this is an exception to prove the rule because it, it has elements which are uh, more closely related to Thuluth. Mm -hmm. Thuluth is generally uh, reserved for buildings and, and more monumental size. But this is a kind of almost amalgam between ideas which are related to Thuluth and Muhattad to join together. Mm -hmm. It's a very unique script. And what, what's extraordinary about it is um, the way the, the gold is outlined by the black and the black is outlined by the gold. This must have been a royal project. I mean, it's too much. It's, or, in fact, or all the... All the manuscripts you've seen so far, all royal projects. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they belong to the Ilkhanid dynasty, uh, so, so they, they come from uh, out of, uh, you know, so following uh, the destruction of Baghdad, you'd expect that to be the, the demise of so much beauty in the Islamic world, but in fact mm -hmm. it becomes a spur to, to new and greater heights. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I go back to uh, this, the, it was Sultan Oljaitu, who's uh, the grandson of Hulagu, I think, uh, who um, commissioned this manuscript out of Mosul. And, um, and this manuscript, of course, is, uh, came out of Baghdad. And this, uh, this, uh, this manuscript we're looking at, this giant, gigantic manuscript, almost certainly is, uh, you know, one, one speculates, it must be the, the same illuminator and calligrapher. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, involved, so it's, it may well be Ibn Sheikh Sohrawardi again, and certainly the same illuminator, who, who's who's got a name Ahmad Ibn Aybak, I think. Mm -hmm. So now the, here's another one of Oljaitu's manuscripts, um, not not as the giant size like the previous one, but this is a similar size to this manuscript, um, and th this was for Sultan Oljaitu as well, but this is. For, Produced in Hamadan, and there where were, are these where are these pages? I mean, where they do where do they come at the opening, beginning uh, of the book? Yes, now, now um, uh, uh, Martin Ling mentions that in earlier uh, Qurans you don't have this uh, these illuminated earlier pages, and mm -hmm. you start with the Quran itself. But these are like a sort of preface almost, and. Uh, uh, Martin Ling says it's almost as if Providence uh, was holding something in reserve as a wonderful thing that could be added to Quran uh, illumination at a later stage. Here, really, it's, it's illumination that comes first and the Quranic elements that are sometimes added in, like the Quranic bands at the top and bottom here. Um, so this would, introduce, would, it, would it introduce a Jews? Yeah, exactly. And, the, and this, this particular Quran is divided into 30 ajza. Uh -huh. And each judge has its own magical introductions. Let me just quickly take you through, and then we'll come what back. What do you call this opening? What do you, what would you call it? I mean, uh, what in the English word? How is it termed? This uh, opening. Uh, uh, um, just I'm opening. not sure. Uh, yeah, I think it's an opening. Yeah. An illuminated, uh, 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 a double illuminated opening, maybe. Mm -hmm. And, and this so is uh, having uh, 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 you, you, you remember Sayyid Tajamal Hussain? Uh, 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 so you have to remind me, sorry. The, who was inspired by, and he was used to take guidance from Sheikh Bakr, and he did a lot of research, uh, especially on the Uljaitu yeah. Quran's opening pages. So tomorrow we are having a memorial uh, talk on his work 
by his wife from Beirut. How wonderful. <laughs> so, but the, you know, the, one of the extraordinary things about this uh, manuscript is it was given as a gift clearly by uh, the Khanid uh, Khans of uh, uh, the, the Eastern Islamic world in uh, as a gift to the Mamluks who were their sort of great rival dynasty. And um, it's almost to show them how wonderful our work is, as opposed to your work. <laughs> and and the wonderful thing is that the entire 30 ajza of this book exists still intact. And, and so, and I've often thought, why isn't this book reproduced uh, for everyone to have in miniature form? So let, let me just show you some of the sa samples. So this is an opening for different jewels. And this is... Uh, one of its opening illuminated pages. And here, here's another illuminated page. And here, so one of the text pages with surah headings towards the end of the Quran. And this is from the final parts of the, this is uh, uh, Surah uh, Al Al Falak. Uh, and, um, Surat um, al But going back, um, again, since I don't have the notes to hand where I've written them, but uh, Martin Ling says the most wonderful thing about these illuminated uh, pieces. I mean, nothing in these great works of sacred art are arbitrary, really. And they're gifts mm -hmm. from heaven. Um, what it is is the artist here is trying to uh, represent something of God's majesty and infinitude, and his absolute infinite perfection. And, and yet, if you want to suggest infinitude, how can you bring that to bear on a, on a limited, finite page? And, and what, what the artists do, they have this wonderful star form. Of course, the star itself is a symbol. Uh, it's a sort of radiating symbol uh, um, uh, which suggests infinitude. Uh, but here the pattern, you can see, is echoed in the margins. The, this central roundel, uh, the central star, there's a quarter of it appears in the corner of the page. Oh. And so you, you realize that this, this pattern actually uh, continues. One's imagination rebuilds mm. the missing part of this uh, pattern that disappears mm. actually under the page or under the illumination. And so... You, you build a finite image, but you suggest an infinite domain of, of, this, uh, of this pattern spreading. Um, is it, uh, considering the time... Yes. And uh, we, we, can't we have another session with you at some point? <laughs> oh, definitely. Now, now how, what, what, uh, how much time do we have remaining? Uh, maybe five I mean, minutes? Yeah. Yes, uh, you could have five minutes, and then because there's some interesting comments, so we'll go to those yes. once you wrap up. Well, look, uh, let me um, do you the terrible injustice of galloping you through some of the pictures. Mm. But, but one thing I do want to mention to you is, uh, uh, again, uh, to, to draw attention to what Martin Lin says about the symbolism of color. Uh, I mean, mm. gold uh, represents light, and the Quran, of course, is light. And so uh, gold is very naturally the, the, the color that predominates mm. in uh, uh, Quranic, uh, I mean, quite often for the text itself or, or the illumination. And then blue uh, is, is, a, is um, a color of mercy. And the, the Quran, of course, is a mercy for, for mankind. It's a, uh, all of this uh, illumination and artwork, it shows something of the descent of uh, of, of something transcended into our world uh, the presence of the sacred in the page and somehow it draws us back to heaven through i mean like the impetus here of these wonderful elements in the margins pointing back towards heaven um, and martin Ling says when in some manuscripts where occasionally when the the book is rebound and, and some of these elements are clipped he, I remember he says a wonderful expression, he says, how little has been removed, yet how much has been lost. Um, <laughs> because, because in the symbolism, if you clip the tip of, the, of one of these uh, figures, it would be as if you've removed 
the heaven to which the the um, uh, the these symbols are pointing. Uh, but but it's a wonderful. It's almost like an unwritten rule that uh, Sidi Abu Bakr points out is that the, the blue and gold often mm -hmm. come together, and quite often, if you look I into, for instance, here, you'll find that the outer uh, colors often everything is outlined in blue, and wow. um, and uh, I remember Martin Ling's talking about the word al mohit in Arabic. Uh, you know, uh, is one of the divine names. God surrounds all, uh, uh, you know, and the, the word mohit also means ocean, and that is a sort of blue color. And the blue, of course, uh, represents the sky and um, uh, the, 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 the infinitude and the mercy of nature. Statement that the divine mercy encompasses all. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember the the Quranic uh, quotation. <laughs> it's, uh, the, um, and well, and if, if you go back to some of these, yes. something like that. Yeah. And um, there, there's here something of um, uh, this the symbolism. Martin Ling speaks of the spider's web. You know, this, the spider's web has a sort of like an echoing effect. If you think of it as as the concentric circles within a spider's web, and then there's the radiating arms of the spider's web that uh, so if there's radiation and reverberation, so to speak, in one um, that are represented in in these uh, beautiful uh, uh, frontispieces. Uh, uh, so let me, here is, uh, this is Mubarak Shah, who we saw as um, one, of the, uh, one of the great disciples of Yakut, and we saw one of his Nast examples earlier. And, and, and this, this example exists in Cairo, and it's like a sort of, it's a half size of the Sohrawardi. So I was thinking that had I been able to complete my project with um, Bahij Andari, we could have used this as a sort of guide for rebuilding the Sohrawardi missing uh, volumes, because because this this uh, Quran is only missing Juz fourteen. This is Yahya Jamali a Sufi again, but his his uh, his um, uh, his muhakkab. and then this uh, this uh, manuscript is in Shiraz. Now we come to uh, some of the great manuscripts from uh, the Mamluk uh, world. And what I'll do is I'll just quickly uh, cycle through. I mean, this is a tremendous frontispiece. I think this came after the fall of the uh, Ilkhanid dynasty in the East. Uh, and some of those uh, artists came and joined uh, uh, the, the Mamluk. This is unbelievable. So, so this has a sort of Ilkhanid and Mamluk, so to speak, fusion of things. And, and here... Uh, a very very beautiful opening, uh, and it has these sort of Chinese elements. Uh, so it's not the best photograph, that one. But these are uh, also very large manuscripts. Uh, um, you know, the, the seeing them small doesn't do them justice. Um, Leo, I found that verse: "Wa rahmati wasiyat kulla shayin." Yes, mashallah. That's exactly exactly right. So, so the My mercy encompasses everything. <laughs> exactly. So, in a, in a certain sense, the the Quran. You see, here we go. Even the blue around this sacred text is mm. is God's mercy in enfolding, in, in so to speak. Mm. Uh, let me look. Uh, let me just zoom in on this extremely beautiful text. Wow, 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 wow. It looks like Mohakkak. Yes, it is, it is a Mohakkak. And, uh, but each Mohakkak, I mean, you can see uh, Ibn Sheikh Sohrawardi's Mohakkak is mm -hmm. immediately recognizable as his own. So here I'm zooming in so you can get a sense of what you would feel like in front of the very big manuscript. In a certain sense, when you see the whole page like this, it doesn't do it. Justice, no. the, the sort of sense you would get when you are coming up close to it. 
Yes. And here's this, uh, another, uh, uh, the same calligrapher possibly, in another giant manuscript, uh, and this was in Turkey. Mm. There's some very beautiful uh, Chinese elements here. So you can see there's a sort of, and these Chinese elements tended to be more from the, uh, the Ilkhanid domain. This was probably also in the first edition because we made a copy of this uh, border, I remember. I traced it for a project. Yes, it, interesting enough, this, um, this opening is in the Chester Beatty, but its original manuscript uh -huh is actually in the John Ryland's uh, uh, library in, um, uh, in Manchester. And um, mm -hmm. the, the, this calligraphy style actually changes throughout the, the stuff and it becomes more, uh, uh, it has more influence from um, uh, the Ilkhanid style as you go, as you go forward. Uh, the fo this is a rather bad photograph of another beautiful manuscript in the British Library uh, from, from Egypt. Uh, it has a very famous calling for Ibn Wahid, I think it's called. Rather beautiful. But let me... Um, th th this is an unusual mixture of, of, of uh, red and, and gold. It's not always blue. Sometimes red does uh, has this aspect of joy and and splendor somehow. But, uh, so you see these little finials pointing into the heavenly space, uh, sort of at the margins of the the page. It's sort of uh, this is a a, a manuscript uh, that I was very happy to photograph for Martin Ling's because it's it, it's. Um, Possibly the earliest example of um, the lotus symbol that appears in Quranic illumination. Mm -hmm. And if, if you see these beautiful lotuses, uh, they've come from the Far East. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is almost a precursor to some of the very great um, manuscripts of Sultan Shaban. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's produced a little bit earlier. I can try and find, let me just find the reference in the book. Uh, Sultan Shaban is in Egypt. Yes, uh, these are again um, 13th and 14th century. There's a very useful uh, thing that Martin Lings points out that the year 700 Hijra happens to be the, the year 1300 uh, AD. So, so, it, so these uh, manuscripts, uh, this is 119, um, this is. Uh, Dated 739 or 1338. Ah. Um, so, so that's like some of the earliest. So th these are the internal pages of that Mus'haf. And this is the final pages, uh, the final opening. And this is the, the one of those uh, Sultan Shaban series of monumental, very, very beautiful Qurans from Cairo. So I'm just going to scroll through them quickly. Uh, they're, they're breathtakingly beautiful. One really needs to have this book and spend a lot of time. You can see each one is uh, so majestic in its own kind of way. Mm. Let me just uh, zoom in on this very beautiful video. Very majestic. Yeah. And here you have this wonderful sort of echoing effect again of the um, the, the reverberation and echoing and radiation of the, the absolute infinite in this uh, wonderful pattern. And, mm -hmm. um, and you need the double page, as Sidi Albaik points out, you know, the, this, uh, this stylized tree or shamsa pointing to paradise. It needs its opposite on the left-hand page to balance uh, uh, and to give this uh, the, the opening sort of harmony. So I'm going to This is a slightly later, uh, and we're moving towards the Timurid end of things. Uh, so I do uh, since your uh, since you yourself are Sidi Timur, 
I have to talk about uh, this is uh, uh, Songur Mirza produced this, and um, he's the grandson of uh, Taymur Khan. And uh, each of these pages is about the size of a door. And, uh, and the following opening in the book, we try to give a sense of the size of the, the original page oh. by, by giving it sort of uh, a life-size rendition of just some of the lettering. But, uh, but something that you will find absolutely staggering about this, uh, these two photographs come from the Iran Bastan Library in Tehran. And they're both framed. Um, and I photographed them both, and I asked the the the, um, the, the, mu the museum uh, director if I could take them out of their frame and photograph behind. And he said, you'd be wasting your time, because if you took them out of the frame, you find that the back of them is blank. And I said, how, how is that possible? He said, well, actually, the two openings that you see are a single page that has been carefully sliced uh, in two. Uh, <laughs> front and back, and, and the front and back are both being framed, so that you can see the front and back at the same time. And so, so, so in fact, that's why the, you'll see that in this, in the representation, these two pages aren't actually joined in the middle. They actually represent, in, in the original, um, they represent a single sheet that's back to back, although the text does actually continue. <laughs> so... Now, by the time one gets to, uh, again, uh, just a quick uh, recap of uh, one of the key touchstones he gives is he says that all civilizations, they start with this great sense of awe predominantly. And the, the art of that civilization hasn't yet been born. At the time of the Prophet, salam, there, there, there was no Islamic tradition. Uh, um, calligraphy and illumination at that point. But in a certain sense, all of the civilization that follows uh, the founder of a religion, they, they are the flowering of the seed that's planted by the original prophet. And um, uh, and when the elements of Mahafa, Mahabba and Ma'arifa are all in great balance, that's really when the civilization is at its peak. And in a certain sense, these um, uh, uh, you know, pages like this um, represent something of that peak. The, the geometric rigor represents something of the Mahafa, so does the Kufic illumination. The Ma'arifa, of course, is represented by the, the, the meaning of the words themselves. And the Mahabba with, with the element of the arabesques and the, 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 the repetitions for, uh, and the, the repeated element of the arabesque almost is evocative of the rep recitation of the Quran itself. Uh, but if 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 we come here to the ta this is the later uh, later Timur piece, um, you're beginning to see a kind of um, a softening of the element of Mahafa and almost an expanding of the element Mahabba and a greater sort of delicacy. But Sheikh Haubak Radiallahu uh, An. He, he he speaks of the, these elements still being satisfying and in balance, but in a way, there's a sort of hint here of what's to come with a certain certain degree of uh, 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 passing of the peak of the civilization in in future. And uh, so here we return to a Timurid manuscript, which in fact this is the the, the opening. Uh, uh, pages of the same uh, Mus'haf that contained the, 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 the pages that started me on my journey. So, so we've now returned to that same picture I showed you at the very beginning of the talk. So now to just quickly jump in the, in the five second Gallup roundup, it, this is the development of Kufic in the Western Islamic world. Uh, the, in the Maghrib, in fact, uh, uh, everything continued to do, be based on the development of Kufic. And Nas didn't really uh, influence in the same way as it did in, in the Eastern Islamic world. So everything in the Islamic West is a sort of development of the original Kufic. Mm -hmm. 
this is actually a very large manuscript. It, it, you have such beautiful effects as, as, as this. Uh, this is a very large manuscript uh, uh, given um, uh, by uh, a prince to, to his, uh, his nursemaid, I believe. Uh, and if you try to, uh, this is his Qasat Qulubakum Min Baad Dhalika Fahiya Kal Hijarati. And if you are able to see that, and then um, uh, these are some of the frontispieces from the Islamic West. And you get much more of a sense of the reverberation in some of these pieces, and um, that there's a tendency towards uh, having the geometric patterns that you see in the East, but in the West there's a there's a tendency to have this strap work. You you take the the, the line that delineates two uh, geometric forms, and you, and you develop it as a strap. So you get this sort of, uh, uh, this echoing, uh, it's much more of a sort of reverberating pattern. And you get this much more in the West than in the East. Here's an example of uh, red predominating as opposed to the blue. This is a manuscript in the top Tapu Palace. And, and this, this is uh, another of the most tremendous manuscripts you can possibly imagine. It's, it's a vast size and, uh, of vellum sheets. Unfortunately, it's been very badly damaged. It's in two enormous volumes where somebody at some point has come in and cut out a lot of these beautiful uh, roundels. And, um, so there's not that many pages that remain intact as far as the illumination is concerned, but this is one of the pages. And, uh, and uh, Martin Lings has wonderful commentary on this uh, about, about how the, this, for instance, this beautifully majestic Kufic sewer heading, it almost sort of personifies gold itself. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, let me, and these beautiful, the, the beautiful symbolism and workmanship. And then the beautiful little suns between each, uh, each, each ayah. Uh, I'm just going to gallop through to the end because I know that we will be short of time. Uh, again, you see the predominance of the strap work. <laughs> the Kufic developed uh, in the West has this wonderful, almost feminine quality in this, uh, these beautiful table forms in some of them. Uh, this is this is uh, how, how many of the manuscripts of the West this kind of calligraphy would have uh, been used. And it's, it's fantastically clear to read as well. It's very economical. And uh, this is the last plate in in Martin Lindsay's book, which is uh, mm -hmm. not it's only a few hundred years old. This this, uh, but great calligraphy continues down to the present day. Whereas great illumination is not is, is a, a commonplace thing. Uh, so let me, maybe we could go back, Sidi uh, Temur, to uh, the picture of Martin Lings there uh, uh, sitting in his window. Um, so do we have a moment or two? Let it, let me just pull that out. Um, here it is. Let me read just a couple of things. Uh, given the fact that I've given you a very brief overview, but some of the wonderful quotes from Martin Lings in his book, then you can then place them into what I've been trying to say. Um, so on page 40 of the book, he says this, uh, it was as if providence had been holding something in reserve, namely the consciousness of what could be achieved by illumination alone, or by pages in which it was introduced as an auxiliary to the illumination. Uh, that's when he's talking about his wonderful fantasies. Um, 
uh, on page 41, he says, if man proceeds by radiation and reverberation, he must also return by the same two modes of movement. So in a certain sense, the, the, uh, the illumination on these Quranic pages are evocative of a means of return for us symbolically. Um, then uh, he, he talks in various places about the symbolism of number. It says a man is symbolized by the number five, the, the world by the number four. So in a certain sense, the, the frame of the Quran itself, whether it's landscape or vertical, or whether it's a square Quran, it represents the world. So when you see the text within a, within a fourfold framework, you're representing the, the divine presence within the world. It's wow. just like, and, um, and man is the center of that world. So in a certain sense, if you, when you see the center point on a star in one of these illuminated pages that we've been seeing in the frontispieces, that's evocative of, of man as the center. But then man is, is true man only as the number six. This is only as the number six that you have height and depth. So you have the four corners of, uh, of the world, so to speak, north, south, east, west, and then height and depth. Um, um, Martin Lee refer, refers to the symbolism of the spirit, uh, which is one of the great symbols is the wind. And the winds are traditionally referred to as eight in number. So eight mm. is, uh, the number eight gives wings, so to speak, to our return. And so, so you sometimes see the number eight uh, appearing in some of these patterns. And also you see the octagon is a way of moving from the square to the circle. Um, let me see other things. Um, in talking about these um, beautiful frontispieces, uh, he, he, he refers to the star in the frontispiece as unimprisonable. And that's another way of explaining that way of radiating. Um, and, and the unfinished repetitions in the corners of uh, these uh, frontispieces is it, that echo. His mind fills in the elements that are incomplete. Um, and uh, Martin Lees would refer to some of these um, illumination, illuminated frontispieces as being a, a, a summit of abstract painting. Um, <laughs> you know what makes an abstract painting is a modernist thing, but in the, if abstract painting could have its true value, these paintings, in a way, are some of the greatest abstract paintings that have ever been produced. And I think the, the frontispieces and the Qurans we've been seeing now, I mean, they, they easily rank as highly as some of the great treasures, let's say, Tutankhamun's tomb that were ever found, or some of the very greatest uh, highlights of any civilization you can imagine, the great cathedrals of Europe. You know, the, and, uh, and they rank, even though they're much smaller, they rank... Uh, in greatness with some of the great mosques uh, that you find wow. around this. Wow. I mean, the, uh, and the, 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 here's another quote. Sacred mm -hmm. art is itself transparent and it thus confronts man with what he must become. So, you know, in a way, the, the perfection and transparency of these images in front of one's mm -hmm. eyes, they're, they're sort of Tazkir, calling us, you must flow and become perfect. And, and interestingly enough, the, the calligraphers um, uh, who, who, uh, who, uh, and the illuminators who, who worked on these manuscripts knew that if their souls were imperfect, then it would show in their hand, and it would show in the calligraphy. So they had mm -hmm. to perfect their own souls to be worthy of becoming master calligraphers. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how um, the great Quranic uh, arts are very closely associated with Sufi orders and great spiritual men. And quite often the, uh, the, the, the spiritual masters behind the inspiration are, so to speak, uh, unknown. They're, they're in the background. And some mm -hmm. of the great artists would sit at their feet and be inspired by them. 
Uh, there's another quote I can read for you, page 47. These paintings present multiplicity as a veil through which oneness can clearly be seen. I think it's a wonderful... Uh, uh, Martin Ling's always had such a wonderful way of distilling things down to their absolute quintessence. Um, uh, let me give, read you another quote. Uh, with the passage of time, as regards the three principles of spirituality, fear, love, and knowledge, the second of these, that is love, tends to push aside the other two, sinking thereby itself to a lower level. There is a wonderful point, that final detail, that uh, Mahabha itself is only really, rep it shows its greatness when it's sitting in balance in the company of Mahafa and Marifa. And, and, and when you start uh, withdrawing, so to speak, from the rigors of discipline and knowledge and, and, and compensating with too much flowery, uh, you know, arabesque, uh, you lose the, the majesty of the arabesque itself to a certain degree. Um, let me quote uh, other things. Oh, it's referring to that wonderful Kufic uh, manuscript we saw at the end, um, talking about the heavy gold Kufic uh, surah headings. He says, uh, but if these surah headings appear heavy, uh, they are only heavy with that heaviness, which is the dew of gold. Mm. Uh, and I've got another little one line quote here. Oh, myster uh, a mysterious omnipresence which vibrates simultaneously in all directions. But that was something that he quoted um, uh, when we were talking about some of those Maghrebi uh, manuscripts. Um, well, I think that that's, uh, that, that's me just randomly dipping in and out of things that he said here and there. But really, I can't, uh, I can't emphasize enough how important it would be to read the text of this. It, it's, it's full of treasures. Uh, but this is, this is really a wonderful introduction also to the text and yeah. to this art because most of us are completely unaware that this art exists. It's well, it, quite uh, ignored. And, and uh, really, uh, with this one book, I think one mm. has the keys to a lifetime of looking at sacred things. Yeah. He, he uh, thank you enough, Sidi Mustafa Khan. Thank you enough. Very, very grateful for this just amazing, typical Mustafa Madzoub session, yeah. completely absorbing <laughs> and riveting. Uh, well, thank you As very much for having me on your Hastan East. Jazakallah yeah. once again from all of us. And people really appreciated that as you, you can later see on Facebook and the comments.